Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Comedy Film Nerds Podcast. Episode 270. Man. Oh. Every week, I look at the number and go, holy shit, that's a lot. We've done 31 spoiler episodes, so we've already done over 300 episodes. It's not including some of the live ones or the premium episodes. We're probably at about three, a little less than 310. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. And we've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to be talking about some obscure movies that we want you guys to know about, like The Battered Bastards of Baseball. Yeah. In addition to The Forger, uh, Tomorrowland, and uh, some really offensive movies on DVD and (laughs) Blu-ray this uh, week that we'll be talking about as well. (laughs) Oh, God, the right. Oh, Jesus, The Loft. That's right. I saw. Oh, no. And Seventh Son. Oh, God. (laughs) It's That's, like, you know, DVDs are just uh, trying to kill you. Well, this we week. put Joe in there just to shake it up. But it did, yeah. And, but that didn't, come, that didn't come out this, no. this week. But, uh, we, we had, had we had yeah. to, we had to palate cleanse. <laughs> we had the to DVDs. put something <laughs> in that section so it doesn't offend. Um, the PDF doesn't blow up. Yeah. So, uh, we have one thing we wanted to announce to you guys too. Uh, we mentioned it before, but we have a, um, Amazon affiliate now that we've put on the home page. So if you go to comedyfilmers.com and you're going to be buying something from Amazon anyway, definitely please um, go through there. The other thing you could do is if you click on the little Amazon link in the top right and make that kind of like your Amazon home page, then you don't even have to worry about it. You could just every time you go to that Amazon page, you know, you, you know, you're an affiliate for us and we'll, uh, we'll get a little taste. Yeah. And we've been enjoying what you guys have been buying. They're a lot, telling of, us- a lot of wrestling action <laughs> figures, uh, that you guys are buying, which is fantastic. Is that Sean Merrick? Yeah. Is that, is that our old former intern, Sean Merrick, who's big into wrestling? Yeah. So uh, we are enjoying your purchases. Keep buying weird shit on Amazon, you guys. Just, <laughs> Just so you know, Our we fans don't... really like doilies. Yeah, what? I don't <laughs> care. Yeah, good. Somebody bought um, rope, twine, and duct tape, which didn't seem weird at all. Oh, that's yeah. and lime and, and a keep shovel. the yeah. lime and <laughs> shovel out here. You're just a hobbyist. <laughs> And just so, you, just so you know, we don't know. Um, it just gives us what's being bought, not who's buying it. No, we don't know. We don't know who. But if you guys are out there storing bodies, uh, we don't need to know. No, just buy everything you need through Amazon. Yeah, it helps the site out. You yeah. really help the show. <laughs> you're going to spend. The, you're not spending extra money. Do your part, psycho. Yeah. <laughs> so weird a human part farmer or whatever you're. Saw five yeah. movie I'm enthusiast. planting toes today. Yeah, yeah. there you go. What do you go plant toes? We appreciate it as long as you use your the hitchhiker jerky. Yeah, you know? hitchhiker jerky. <laughs> oh, we gotta tell this story. Oh. So we uh, that's our. Have we introduced our guest? No, no, let's haven't. introduce our guest. I'm just chiming in. Sorry. Uh, no, no. It's uh, he's been on the. It was about three years ago. Maybe you yeah. did the show. Uh, longtime friend. We performed together a bunch. Uh, Mr. Gary Brightwell. Hey, thanks, man. Um, so Gary and I in March mm-hmm. were on a tour. of of military bases. Uh, you, Gary, you hooked me up with this comics on duty. Right. Yeah. And um, this was all Air Force bases throughout the whole month of March. Oh, is this the tour where you only flew at 4 a.m. in the morning? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. It was yes. the dumbest oh. flight times of oh, God. imaginable. A multi- yeah. Different airlines. And I was just mm. like, you guys are killing me. Like, just give me the money. I'll book it. Right. I'll, <laughs> I'll pay extra. I don't care. Like, we had a... Oh, so the shows, of course, were great. Yeah. But you're going to these towns like Altus, Oklahoma, and Great Falls, Montana, and Minot, North, Minot, North, North Dakota, and like Grand Forks. And we right. drove from Grand Forks to Minot. So you fly in, and on all the tours, it was me and Gary and Danny Viapondo, and then there was a different fourth guy on right. on each one. Right. So uh, one time it was uh, Paul Ogata, uh, who I'd never met. Like Danny and Paul and all these guys, all these other guys I'd never met before. I've known Gary for a long time. So that was really cool. And we would – the trips are a lot of fun. Like, I mean, it's like you're getting up early and, you know, we're right. comedians, so we're making fun of everything. But it's a lot of fun. We're in the car. Yeah. You forget about it. It's like it's like you've gone back to those road days of getting in the car with another comic and being on the road for three days mm-hmm. or whatever it is. So it's – but now we've all done that already and now it's like revisiting it and we're still having fun and yeah. we're all headliners mm-hmm. in our own right so it's like you it's, know so how did, how did we get to hitchhiker jerky from there <laughs> well, <laughs> well this is Paul Ogata <laughs> we were you, you drive through these towns and literally they're a block long and there's there's nothing 
Right. And and we're all making jokes like, oh, my God, like, what do you do here? Like, how do you, you know, one, I mean, the one time we were stuck in Altus, Oklahoma, and they had an Applebee's and a Walmart, and that was like... Downtown. That was the, yeah. that was amazing. That was we went to we were stuck in was, they were snowed in, so we ate at Applebee's like twice, and that was like the most amazing meal. Yeah. So I, I mean, the people are really nice and everything, but you're in these towns somewhere. You're like, God. You drive through the parts of America, and you're like, Holy shit! Like this is in the middle of nowhere, and we make jokes like, God, how do you live here? And Paul Ogata goes, I don't think it would be bad to live here. You know, you'd get a nice little house over there, and then eat hitchhikers. <laughs> 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 But Paul Ogata, I'd never met before. He's a funny dude. He's been doing it yeah. forever. He's from Hawaii, and he just has this deadpan. Mm-hmm. And we all just start fucking laughing. Right. And then it got to where it's like, I w- we were driving. And then to me, I always would see, you see a farm, and then they have like a barn. And then right next to the barn, they have like a dilapidated farm, <laughs> a barn that's about ready to fall over at any moment. I kept thinking, why do you keep that crappy one? And then Grant says, that's where you keep your hitchhiker meat. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah and then either Paul or Danny goes, yeah, it's great hitchhiker jerky. And then it was like. It turned into it was, everything, it was, yeah. It was, it was all this hitchhiker jerky. Um, so, you know. Well, that answered the question. Yeah. yeah. So go to Amazon and buy some hitchhiker jerky. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I want to talk about, oh, I, I say real quick. Yeah. Uh, I just want to thank everyone that came out. I did a Doug Loves Movies in Dallas, Texas at Hyenas, mm-hmm. uh, which was a lot of fun. And now, this has happened mo- multiple times. I do Doug's show, and in the middle of the show, he goes, oh, Graham, you should whistle. So I have an insanely loud whistle. Yes. I do it, and then I get all this shit on Twitter, like, shut the fuck up, Graham, you blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, Doug said Graham's going to whistle. So I do it, and then people get mad. So if there's any Douglas Movies listeners to this show, I try to move the microphone away People get. I don't want to blow out anybody's eardrums. Um, but what? But if Doug's going to request it, it Doug said you he's should. He's the host, right? He's the whistle, and I I started doing this loud siren, and Doug's doing it with me. But all I hear on Twitter is I'm the dick. <laughs> and, well, maybe that's Doug's insidious plan. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure he's laughing every time he <laughs> slowly <laughs> take you down episode yeah. by episode. As you're whistling, he's going into the microphone. Make sure you give Graham shit on Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry if I hurt any of your ears, and I'm sure if you listen to this show, you're not. You don't hate me. <laughs> I'm guessing. But so I have an automatic block policy on Twitter. When someone says something truly assholey, automatic block. Automatic block. Automatic block. Um, automatic. So let's uh, let's get into these movies. I really right. want to talk about tomorrow. All right. Um, you went to the big crazy yes. El Capitan. Uh, made, made it an event. Sure. Made it an event. Yeah. Whole family. Whole family. family. Went down, um, got our tickets in advance. Um, got the VIP seating where you get the popcorn and the drink and the little um, tomorrow. Land. You get the pin. Do they uh, bring it to you, or you have to stand in line? You got to stand in line. Okay. Too. Yeah, they didn't bring it to us, unfortunately. What kind of and animals? Then, and then there's uh, what kind of savagery you know, are they subjecting you, know, you to there? And what I love about these old theaters is there's a hundred curtains that go up from the screen. Right. You know, there's always like, oh, well, that's that has to be the last curtain. Nope. There's one more that uh, goes up, and then they show the trailers, and then they close the curtains again, and then a magic show started. So kind of themed like with Tomorrowland and. Um, let me just say, could have done a little bit better with the magic show. Who is you the know, guy? Do you know his name? I, I, I don't remember who it was, but it I was, know magicians. So. It was uh, it was a magician. <laughs> you worked at the comedy magic club. Worked at the comedy magic club, so I know all kinds of. I mean, chances I'm, are, you know him because he looked like he's been doing it for about a hundred years. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, you're really you're still doing the card with the dots on it, flipping it back and forth. I mean, tricks that I saw as a kid, right? That you're still seeing. I'm like, no, you. You know, hey, magicians, step it up a little. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, you know, and they, they did a couple, like, cool kind of Tomorrowland, like, big prop magic things where, you know, the big pin appeared and stuff. But ultimately, it was a a bit of a thrown-together magic show that uh, didn't really add to the uh, <laughs> the experience. But then nobody cared. The magic show was over. Then the movie actually started. Now, this I was really looking forward to this movie, and I will say this is one of those weird movies that's got a lot of pedigree kind of behind it. Brad Bird, the director, did Iron Giant, uh, I think even one of the Mission Impossible movies, and you've got George Clooney in it, and you've also got, um, you know, one of the writers from Lost, uh, Lost, and 
Um, you could see in this movie, this, this movie, Brad also did uh, Ratatouille. Yes, yeah, he's an animation director, but then branched off into live action. He did The Incredibles. Yeah, I mean, uh, some great, great films. Wow, and, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he did Ghost Protocol. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm watching this movie, and I'm thinking to myself, parts of this movie are kind of a mess, and parts of this movie are really amazing. There's some amazing scenes in this film. And other parts, you're like, oh, what are they doing? Like, what? This is taking too long to get to where I want to go, to actually get to Tomorrowland. The first um, part of it was just way too long, too yeah. much setup. And you also saw some kind of, like, um, noty stuff, like, uh, like we need to get George Clooney in the movie earlier. So, like, there's this weird, like, voiceover where he's talking into the camera at the beginning that you don't need at all, at all. You just want to actually get to the story and have it start moving. But... There's some crazy big science fiction ideas in this movie. There's some great animation that starts the movie off. You know, Brad Bird, I'm sure he, he did that animation. And there's also um, a really compelling story, especially with George Clooney's character, about how, as a kid, he was like this inventor, you know, uh, sky's the limit, and uh, uh, he becomes this dis disillusioned adult where it, it's it's such an amazing character, like especially to see like in a family film. I thought it was fantastic. There's some great scenes that you see in the trailer, like with the robots coming after people, and mm -hmm. there was some interesting violence, a little more violent than I thought. Um, you definitely see some people get killed. And the big idea at the beginning that's set up is what I absolutely loved, where you try to create this utopian future, and that's what Tomorrowland was, all the, bright, the best and the brightest. But ultimately, um, money corporations, any, any of those type of things will ultimately ruin it. And the idea and the dream basically um, fell apart. And this is the setup of the movie. This is not a spoiler. This is at the beginning of the film. Um, so I love this premise, and I love the way some of it played out. But there were other parts where, like, well, this is taking too long. This is too slow. This didn't match. It was one of those movies where... Even because of its flaws, I still really liked it. Even though, like, against my bitter judgment, like, well, maybe I shouldn't like it as much. But Brad Bird and George Clooney, and it had such charm to it and such innovative and imaginative imagery, especially when they recreated the World's Fair. It was like I was able to overlook those flaws more than I normally would be able to. So it's it's a really good movie, but it could have been a classic. It could have been, like like, this is the kind of movie I would love to see a director's cut on like how the movie was originally envisioned, but since it's a family movie from Disney, you'll probably never see that. Uh, yeah, I, okay, I saw it last night, and... Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking it's disappointment, like when you go to Tomorrowland at Disneyland and Space Mountain is closed for repairs. Right. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. Yeah. I didn't like completely dislike it. Mm -hmm. I shared a lot of that, Chris. I think of like there was parts of it I liked and parts of it that were messed. The mess parts, I was just kind of like, man, it's just too slow getting going. It's so at the slow. Beginning. I didn't. Now I didn't have a problem seeing George Clooney in the beginning, in the sense that it set up a really interesting thing. And again, this is all in the beginning of the, the setup, right? Because he said, you know, the future when I was a kid was hopeful. Right. Now it's not. Right. Now it's like droughts and the polar ice caps are melting and right. all this crime you know, there's and violence. Crime. There's disease. wars on yeah. every. There right. was, it was mm -hmm. like we thought of the future back then as like it's going to be amazing. And now it's like. Oh, and that was the purpose of the World's Fair. That was what? This is what the future is going to look 64. like. 64. And that's why they built Tomorrowland. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was a cool premise. It tapped into a lot of cool things. Which is a really cool thing, and it's like, because that's all you hear about. There's all these doomsday movies coming out, right. and everyone's mm -hmm. talking about it and all this stuff. I mean, California, we're in a four-year drought. Right. The governor last month said, the days of the green lawn are over. You right. know, like, right. <laughs> so we got to do all these changes and stuff like that. So it was really interesting to acknowledge that and to not just, you know, cute Disney like it's not happening. Like whitewash. Just, yeah. no, it's right. fine. Everything's mm -hmm. great. You know, Tinkerbell will save the day, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so that was cool. Um, but, you know, I've, I happen to be in a theater with really comfortable chairs. Right. And uh, <laughs> I, you know, fell asleep for part of it. Right. Uh, I'm sure it was towards the middle of the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was just like. Because the, the act one literally felt like an hour. It took forever, man. Yeah, yeah to, get, to get going. But, but there mm -hmm. is... 
there is cool things to it, and I went, and I was curious to see because I after the movie I went, oh, it's a good kids movie. Mm-hmm. It's a kids movie, right? That has some adult stuff in it, right? But it is a kids movie for sure, and so I was curious to know like. What like you, like our, my kids both loved it. Of course. Uh, yeah, well, then, they, then, really like then it. in that sense, it's good. Mm-hmm. Then the movie's fine, and it doesn't right. matter what I think. But um, well, I don't know. I think it's with his pedigree, like with Brad Bird, and what they do is they they do more family movies where they're for everyone. Like <laughs> right. Like, and I really think this was a little bit of studio kind of. You know, there has to be more cutesy kid stuff in it. And there it has to felt, be. It, it felt forced in. This is a Disney product right do you know what mm-hmm. i'm saying and it, that's what i felt like they were going up against because like the incredibles is it a, is an amazing film yes it has such great messages it's fun it's it's got it's got great action we get iron giants the same way same way yeah. and i really i felt the same way like god i love brad bird mm-hmm. and i really like george clooney but they were doing the best they could in this framework in this yeah Big corporate Disney framework. So when you look at it like that, some of the more adult stuff that did slip through, you wonder how some of that actually got through. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like you know, kind of the big, you know, mutually assured destruction of the entire world ideas kind of stuff. And also, but you know, you see people getting killed right now, right on screen. Mm-hmm. Huh? And so. uh, I never put the. I loved what they did with the robots too. You see this in the trailer, just like the android humanoid robots, and how George Clooney is like one big. Death trap for robots. Yeah. It, it, was, it was so much fun and so uh, cool. <laughs> it's yeah, and, and like you said, visually, I loved how they depicted actual Tomorrowland. Yes, uh, the '64 fair was great. That was amazing, and that just to see like uh, you know, it's a small world and all those cool things that they did with it, like back in the fair and kind of tied into the movie. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. yeah. So so I, I think uh, I was a little more forgiving on it than than you were, but uh, it's one of those movies that. It, it is. It's a little messy, but I think the charm overall kind of still got me. I still liked it. Yeah, I think I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. All right, let's go to uh, what did you see, Gary? The Forager. I saw the Forager mm-hmm. recently. Forager, um, not a forager. Yeah, yeah. To see, it's with um, uh, John Travolta plays an art forger who who finds art in the forest. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Chris, Chris can't get away from this forest concept. He really wants to. I want there to be a forager in this movie. <laughs> Some sort of woodland character with special powers. Of art. Of art, art guys. <laughs> art powers. Well, I don't know. But Hashtag maybe, paint it. Yeah. Maybe there's, they're trying to find uh, a good story. Maybe that's <laughs> what they're trying to do. Uh, it's with John Travolta plays a uh, an art forger who is in jail who who deals with a crime boss to bribe a judge so he's able to get out of jail 10 months early so he can spend time with his son who has an inoperable brain tumor. Okay. And to pay back the crime boss, he has to forge a uh, a famous uh, Monet painting. Okay. And then but not only just have that as his as his payment but he also has to steal the actual monet painting and replace it with so it's like wow. extra okay okay it's like it's not enough that i can now i have to paint a, a perfect too? now i have to do a heist well t- well to help him with his heist thank god his father played by christopher Plummer. christopher Plummer happens to be that kind of person who would help you just pull off a heist. He's, he's the Pink Panther. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's their family that heists together. Yeah. Chris stays together. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was, and in the middle of that, they're tr- still trying to ch- shoehorn in a, you know, a father getting to know his son in the middle of a heist movie. It's but like, let's just say an older father getting to know an older son. <laughs> right. And then the fa- and then the Christopher Plummer's character realizing that he wasn't as quite as good a father to John Travolta, mm-hmm. you know. It's Wait a like, minute, now he told him how to do a heist. I mean, how bad of a yeah. mess can the guy be? You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't just learn to be a forger on your own. You know what I mean? That sounds like some good father-son bonding yeah, right. time. Somebody bought him his first paint set. Like, they forger. don't show you that, though. They don't, there's no back, you know, there's no there's no story on how he became such a good artist. There's that, that, that You're just supposed right. to just accept that, that right. he's in jail. And now he's a, he's a great artist, and <laughs> it, I don't know. It was like it, 
it seemed like there was too many things. They were trying to do too many things where they just could have had a, you know, could, you, know you didn't have to shoehorn in the, the, the cancer and the, you know, and the, right. the, you know, I'm not a good father thing. It just, I'd rather just see the, the make heist. It a, make it a heist movie. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, the best heist movies are just, there's a little backstory in there. There's a little right. character stuff. But for the most part, they're just heisting. It's just like, that's, and that's what you. <laughs> yeah, they're just heisting. They're just heisting shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a little. Like rollerblading. Co- they're yes. just heisting. That's, they're just heisting. <laughs> that's all you want, a little heisting. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just get some heisting? Yeah, going that's on. all I want. I just want uh, some heisting. A heisting. I just. Want I don't a, need it to feel yeah. good. I don't. I just need a scoop of ice cream. I don't need a lot of nonsense on it. I don't need it on the toast or whatever. Your father was into heisting. Your mother was, was into heisting, heisting. And by God, yeah. you're going to you know, be into heisting. Heisting <laughs> or go home. <laughs> you either heist in this family. All right. Yeah, I get what you're saying. The, the thing is, and, and this is, this is, uh, you're saying, he's, I don't want to say, you know, it, I watched it all. I didn't like stop it and I'll go, this is stupid. Uh, I sat through it and it, it just, it just kind of went along and I was enjoy, and, you know, it filled the time. Right. But there's nothing I was like, you know, when that got done, I was like, that was a great movie. No, nah, it wasn't that. That it didn't just, happen to me. It was just filler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. It killed, it killed the hour and a half. It was an two hours movie. that I needed to do. Yeah. yeah, it's an airplane movie. Perfect. Right. You'd watch it on an airplane and go, oh, great. All right. Now I'm two hours closer to my destination. Yeah, be landing <laughs> soon, and there you go. I'm going to get uh, free food at the club and then uh, do my skits. <laughs> after that, uh, I'm going to do a little heisting for fun. I'm going to go do some heisting. I love heisting after a comedy show. Yeah. No, it really gets the blood pumping. <laughs> but when you get somebody like a like a Christopher Plummer, though, don't you want to like really use him? Yeah, that, more, you would think. Uh, yeah, sure. that's a great example. Like he's one of those guys you would. I mean, let's it, hire Jackie Chan and not have him do any martial arts. Yeah, yeah. Let's just have right, him work exactly. In a store. Yeah, and <laughs> but you know, because to go to like a family heist movie, go to um, God. Is it what is the one with Sean Connery and Dustin Hoffman? Is it the family or the the? Um, and Matthew Broderick. You know, Sean, wait, Sean no. Connery, Dustin, Dustin Hoffman, Hoffman, and, Matthew, and Broderick. Matthew Broderick. There's no way this is like a movie that... Everyone, you made that up. I, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. You guys, when I say the name, you're going to go, oh, you're not going to look at me and go, what are you looking at? Yeah, right. I, I do. Yeah, I want to see that. Family Mo- Business. Family Business, okay. Oh, okay. 1989, directed by Sidney Lumet. Mm-hmm. There's an example. His best film. His best film. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not City Lumet's best film, but it's still a good movie. Mm-hmm. And I think it has all of the things in it that you would you wanted yeah. the forger to have. Well, what's the one like with Matthew Broderick? Yeah. He said you want Sean Connery going, <laughs> oh, what a parasite. He says yeah, about, yeah, right. about Matthew Broderick's girlfriend. Who uh, is played by Victoria Jackson from uh, Saturday, Saturday Night, Night Live? Live. Oh, wow. that's great! <laughs> but that's what you want, and and the relationship between Dustin Hoffman and Sean Connery is this great father, right, son, heisting relationship. <laughs> it's very heistful, <laughs> uh, family heisting. Fam- yeah. Family heist. It's a new genre. It is. <laughs> yeah, family heisting. <laughs> family heisting. So, so it sounds like. Gary's saying you should watch Family Business instead of The Forger. So it sounds like this I, is a remake. I'm going to go. I would go. I might have to go back and revisit that. Yeah. I don't think I've seen that one. You should watch it. Okay. It's good. It's solid. It's a young Matthew Broderick and, and Dustin Hoffman. And Sean Connery is the dad, or he's Matthew Broderick's grandfather, who you know just gets out of jail and he's a career criminal. And Dustin Hoffman's wife, Dustin Hoffman has gone legit. Right. And so his wife is like, I don't want you back in that life. And they go back in that life and... Uh, for one last time? For one last, one last <laughs> score or something like that. And, uh, and then he's out. Yeah. And then Matthew Broderick, you know, gets hemmed up and things go awry. And it's, it's, it's a good... And Matthew Broderick and Dustin Hoffman 
their relationship is is interesting. It's a good it's a good All right. check it out. Family business. Okay. There's Let's more go. to it than than say like a De Niro uh Oh, that was a good movie. What was that one? Robert De Niro and uh Okay, why can't I pull the guy's <laughs> name? <laughs> American History X, uh Edward Norton. Yeah, Ed Norton, that one. What oh, was that? Yeah, with um uh that was with um God, that was with this is horrible. We just keep doing Brando was in Brando that. was in that. Yeah. That is where is that? Oh, the island of Doctor Moreau. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Little Fockers? Is that it? Yeah. Is it? Um, where is that? So, well, the score. The oh, score. 2001, the score. the score. Yeah. Directed by Frank Oz. That was good. Yeah, that is interesting. And then again, that's, it's a heist. That's all you want in your heist, heist movie. movie. Just little intrigue, a little bit of backstory, but not much. You know, like the Italian job. Exactly. You know, you've got, you know, you've got a heist, but you've got little tiny cars driving through uh, small alleyways. That's all you need. That is all you need. Little tiny <laughs> Italian heisting cars. <laughs> all right. So the forger. So let's talk about uh, you guys. Leave it. You guys. <laughs> you guys talk, uh, saw a movie, The Battered Bastards of Baseball, and this was a documentary. Now it's funny when Graham, you were telling me about it. Uh, I was like, "What? That sounds like a made-up story," but it actually. Um, Exists and happened. So did tell you tell about me this about this movie? Gary? I did. I heard about it on uh, Pardo, Jimmy Pardo's podcast, Never Not Funny. Right. And so I, he mentioned. He said, "Oh, it's great. If you're if you're a baseball fan, you're really going to enjoy this." So I was like, "I'm a baseball fan." And you told me I was because I was like, someone told me, and I couldn't remember who. Now I remember. It was on that road trip going to one of those Air Force bases, and right. we were just talking. And you're like, "You got to see this." Yeah. yeah. You were eating hike. Hitchhiker jerky. We were eating hitchhiker and jerky. jerky. And you were talking Mountain about Dew. Baseball. Mountain Dew is in hitchhiker <laughs> jerky. And we were just on the road going gig to gig. Um, so I'll just read you the IMDb. The Battered Bastards of Baseball uh, is one of uh, baseball's last great unheralded true stories. In 1973, Hollywood veteran Bing Russell, Kurt Russell's dad, um, who was uh, played Deputy Clem on Bonanza, created one of the last independently owned Minor league baseball teams in Portland, Oregon. That is not that is not uh, affiliated with any major league baseball mm -hmm. team. Right. So yeah, to give you some, there's no not, farm. So there's no farm. It wasn't a farm system that would feed players to to the major leagues. Yeah. So anybody listening who's not familiar with baseball, or if you live in another country, or in the American baseball system, we you, call it cricket. We call it. <laughs> <laughs> It takes five hours. <laughs> it's in an oval. Um, but no, like you have a team like the New York Yankees. And then they have several. There's there's three levels. There's triple A, double A, and single A. Right. So triple A is obviously the next. They're, they're, they're the closest to going to the major leagues. Right. So each baseball club, the Dodgers, the Chicago Cubs, and they have these minor leagues, and it's their farm system. So they, what happens is a team like the, the, the Los Angeles Dodgers recruits a kid out of high school or college. And then you're going to start playing in single A ball in some small town. And then if you do well, you keep working your way up. And the hope is that then this kid is going to be good enough to be brought up to be to play in the major leagues. Right. Well, you also have different kind of leagues, right? You've got all kinds of leagues all over the country, right? That have all these teams. So, you know, like an American League, a National League, like how? Well, there's there's like like the movie Bull Durham is a is a. The example of a minor league. That's a real team, the Durham Bulls. The Durham Bulls, yes. But, yeah, but that's a, they're a farm system to, right. I think the Atlanta Braves, maybe. Maybe, maybe I'm like that. But yeah, so there's, there's, there's minor league leagues all over the country. There's an East Coast league, there's a Southern league, there's the Grapefruit League, uh, there's a Midwest league. Like Michael Jordan, when he played, um, for the White Sox, when he when he retired from basketball and decided to play baseball, he played for the Chicago White Sox, uh, I think double A team. The Barons. The Barons in Birmingham, Alabama, which is the Southern League. So that's where he played. Now, there's a PCL, like the Pacific Coast League, is the West Coast minor league. And they had a team in Portland that nobody saw and went to, and they left. Yeah. And that's when Bing Russell... Major League pulled the plug on yeah. that team. Mm -hmm. Said, no, we don't need that. We can split the players up between 
two other se- teams and just and they so they basically pulled baseball from this little town. Right. So it's a complicated system of tiers. Basically, right. baseball and, in this country. Right, and that's part of the story is Major League Baseball is this big business, this mm-hmm. big corporate entity, and part of this story is so cool is Bing Russell fought them. Yes. Because he created this single-A team, so it had no affiliation, so he had no draft picks, he had no... He put an ad in the paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Open Do you tryout. play baseball? Right. Come on out and try out for now, this team. Now, I, I don't want you to give any spoilers away, but the one question I have immediately is, you create an independent baseball team. How do you find anyone to play with? Well, no, he. here's what he went in a, le- in a league and said to the people in that league, um, and there's a great interview with the guy that was running the league at the time in the 70s, and said, I want to... I want to I want to join your league and they're like all right and he bought the team he goes you can buy this team in Portland for 5 grand and you're in our league now so his independent team was playing against all of these um minor league teams that were financed by the big teams so that's what he played against them so that's what oh. so so he's playing against and that was part of it is he like Gary said he put an ad in the paper and got guys that you know that that couldn't make open tryouts for mm-hmm. you know for for major league baseball the farm systems there they were just but they still were guys that just could play and wanted to play but they but major league baseball those scouts might not have seen them in the same light and thinking oh th- he, there's no way this guy can fit into our our thing so th- so now they're, they're out now they get another chance to play for another team and their whole deal is. They just want to beat these guys. That's it's it's they're they're not playing for anything. That maybe I can move up. They just want, we're just going to play and beat you. And the great thing is, is you got these, and it's the seventies. So all these cats with this long hair and these Fu Manchu and these <laughs> yeah. big mutton chop sideburns and beards, and they're all like in their late twenties or thirties. Yeah, they got like concrete businesses. Yeah, and, and, you know, but they also go out on the weekends and play. play. Ball. And, and they were like, oh, we got 500 bucks a month for three months of baseball or something crazy yeah. like that. And then, you know, Kurt Russell is interviewed a lot because he, yeah, he played. He played for the team. His dad was a baseball guy. His dad, Bing Russell, like at nine years old was a ball yeah, boy. The coach's dad always gets <laughs> in the game. I was the coach's dad. <laughs> <laughs> because usually the coach's, the coach's son. Yeah, coach's son always gets to play. <laughs> because his fundamentals are almost better. Because he's been in the backyard with the old man since the time he was two. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, um, so like these great interviews with Kurt Russell, and he's like, "I'm 19 years old, and I'm getting to play baseball." And there was one pitcher that got was in the major leagues, was a big time pitcher, and got kicked out or something. Probably blew his arm out or something. And rehabbed it. I don't rehabbed remember. Right? And, and he had he had written a, a tell all book, and everyone in major leagues was pissed at him. So he comes in, and these guys are like, "Holy shit, we're playing with this guy!" And the movie, man, it's it's first of all, it's a very well made documentary. I think Netflix produced it. Right. So they've got great interviews. They've got great, you know, either eight or sixteen millimeter either home or news footage from the seventies. Then they've got um, local TV interviews from like nineteen seventy three in Portland, Oregon, um, and they're playing at Civic Stadium. Now, Civic Stadium is is right in Portland, and it's they, they have now converted it to, I believe it's where the uh, Portland Timbers of the Major League Soccer play, and it's this awesome soccer vibe. But I remember going to a game there when, when my, my mom moved there uh, when I was a freshman in college, and so I spent a summer there between my freshman and sophomore year, and I remember my brother and I, there was a Minnesota Twins organization that played there, and I remember we went, you know, and you spent, spent three bucks or whatever, or five bucks, and you watched minor league guys play. Um, the cool thing about this story was Bing Russell was all about the fans, and he knew baseball. And it's yeah, it's it's all it's a lot about him building a following back up, you know, because baseball was basically taken away from this little small town, and that's all they really really enjoyed right what, what was the real like does it go into like the beginning what was the real reason was it to 
uh, because he had a love of baseball to revitalize the town? Like what, what was the, it was the love of baseball. He, he, when he was nine years old, they lived in Florida or something like that. And he was a bat boy for the Yankees Mm -hmm. during spring training. And he's got home footage and photos of him with like Mickey Mantle. And like, I mean, so he's nine years Mm -hmm. old. And so he, they kept saying he was a, he understood baseball. And he moved out to Hollywood, and, they mo- and he started working in the pictures. You know, Kurt Russell said something like, "My dad was killed on screen 127 times, or something like that." Right. You know? But he always loved baseball. Hmm. Always in the backyard playing it. Always went to games. Right. And the the movie basically shows how he's he rebuilt a following for this ragtag, to mm-hmm. use that corny <laughs> <laughs> phrase. But he and. He's like a marketing genius, and he oh, builds yeah. a huge following to where it that to a point that Major League Baseball can't uh, kind of blow him off, and so they want to buy back in. This is where the story gets. We won't spoil. Oh, okay, okay, but, okay, but, yeah, but exactly. this is this is this is where it gets interesting because he then he starts breaking attendance records. Oh wow! Yeah, and 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 it became a thing. Like the city of Portland was like, "This is our team," because none of these. Because here's the thing about minor league baseball: it's hard to like follow the team because yeah, guys are getting called up. They're getting like, so you just sort of. And and I know plenty of towns that have a good minor league baseball team, and the the city comes out, but they just come out. I mean, like they like it, but they're not rooting. Specifically for players, because or, they know they're not going to be there. They're long. right. Mid-season, they could get yanked up. Yeah, whatever. They like, start playing well, then you don't see them anymore. Guys gone. Because <laughs> yeah, they go up to the oh, bigs. Wow. You know. So, but these guys weren't going anywhere. Right. There was nowhere for them to go. There was nowhere for them to go, and they were, you know, they were outcasts and they were freaks, and and it's just, you know, you see them in the locker room, the photos of the movies in the after locker the games, and they're all. <laughs> In bell bottoms and no shirts, drinking beers and smoking cigarettes. You know, it's the <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's just like it's a it's a it's a great story. And you don't have to be if you're a baseball fan, you got to watch it. Right. And if you're not, it's still a good story it's of a great the little story. guy. It's the, it's a great story of the little guy and and like Portland. Um, I, you know, oh, I know it we sounds got, great. Yeah, it's a good thing. Check it out. The Battered Bastards of Baseball. It's on Netflix. Okay. Uh, so now, Gary, we were talking earlier. You like uh, courtroom dramas. I do. And you were talking about specifically um, 12 Angry Men, which uh, is a classic, classic, classic film. And the thing I always loved about that film was the setup. Um, you know, you've got 12 people in a jury, but you also have this setup of like um, the movie – Directed by Sidney Lumet. Yes, his worst <laughs> film. His, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. his worst film. Twelve Angry Men is a bag of shit. He was just what? biding his time for oh, that. Yeah. For that, Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah that Came happened around, twenty yeah. years later, or thirty years later. <laughs> what I loved about this movie, too, I mean, I loved the whole movie, but what I loved about too was the setup. You have these um, jurors in this room. You know, they're all going to be in there together, but. The way they set up the case, like, was this is an airtight case. Obviously, everyone's convinced, you know, there's a murder weapon. It's, uh, all Everything's, like, completely airtight. And then there's just that one doubting juror. And then what I love about it is that everything slowly kind of unravels and gets picked apart. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is also how every different personality in that room reacts to it. Right. So I, I find it, it's, it's, if you haven't seen it, um, definitely check it out, 12 Angry Men. And it's a, also a great, from a filmmaking standpoint, a great example of what's called a compressed time movie and also a very limited location movie. Like everything happens within a short period of time, the entire right. film, and also in, I think it's just, what, one or two locations. It's like the courtroom and the jury, court, right, and that's yeah. it. Well. And also, it's also, I mean, here's one thing about uh, what I loved about that. When you go back and you watch it a couple more times, the fact that the the weather plays a huge part in this. These people are, like I said, they're, they're in this, Wasn't court, it hot, it's right? crazy hot. Yeah. And they, and the fan doesn't work and they're sweating and they're just, they just, we just want to get through this. Can't we just vote and put this guy in I've jail? I've got tickets to something. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's just that. And there's that. That's an element you kind of be, you know, when you first watch, you just kind of overlook, well, it's hot, you know, but then you go, wait a minute, this is really adding to why these people, you know, 
at the very beginning, let's just get the vote out and, and get out of here, you know, where I can get to where it's cool and get something to drink. And one guy says, no, we really could look into this. And yeah, so it's, I enjoyed that. And there's also these great performances by Martin Balsam, uh, Lee, uh, Lee J. Cobb, E.G. Marshall, Jack Klugman, like Jack Warden, Henry Fonda. I mean, it's, it's quite a cast. It's quite a cast and it's black and white. And which I think plays into the sweaty, yeah, close quarter, tense, fucking, ugh, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Like, and, uh, how many women were on that jury? None. <laughs> exactly. None. Which also tells you the time yeah. frame, yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a really uh, it's based on a story by Reginald Rose, but I believe Rod Serling wrote the original for TV. I could be wrong. Um, Oh, that's some weird trivia. I haven't heard that. Uh, well, it was a TV movie. Twelve Angry Men was a TV movie. Um, yeah, and then it was Reginald wow. Rose, the original. Yeah, because I believe it was it was one of those. It was a TV movie on one of those live like um, Playhouse ninety or one oh, of those live okay. broadcast okay. Yeah. ones that Rod Serling wrote on. I know years later Kennedy they did a remake of it. Ninety seven. That was directed by William Friedkin. Yeah, yeah. that had Jack Lemmon and George C. Scott and. Tony Danza. Yeah, Hume Cronin. Yeah, it's a different ball game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay, what are, let me to ask you this. What are some of your other favorite courtroom dramas and why? Um I loved I loved The Verdict. Oh. Paul Newman who right. was up I believe he was up for an Academy Award. Was he was nominated God? and he should have got it and the I don't remember who won. Wasn't it wasn't it the year of Gandhi? Might have, might have, I, I'm so bad with the dates and stuff like that. 1982, yeah, I think it was, he was up against Gandhi, and it was like, no way was... Right. Ben Kingsley was like, again, do you want to know who directed the verdict? Mm-hmm. Little gentleman by the name of Sidney Lumet, folks. <laughs> Did not know that today's episode wow. was going to be a Lumet theme. <laughs> who thought? Read his book, by the way, read Sidney Lumet's book um, about directing... Family Business. <laughs> it's the family business. His grandfather was a prisoner, and then he directed movies in the joint. And no, but uh, Sidney Lumex uh, got a really cool, cool book about it. It's not so much technical if you ever want to get into directing, but it's about um, the sort of emotion and how to deal. Like he talks about different casts. He's like. Well, I had to talk to this guy because he's a Broadway actor this way. This guy was a club comic. I had to talk to him this way. This ah. person was from TV. I had to talk to him that way. That's um, interesting. But anyway, talk about The Verdict. came out in 1982. Yeah, I just think he, he had, like I said, he, he was... <laughs> Listen, I'm sorry. Based on a novel by a guy by the name of David Mamet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, him. That guy. <laughs> so there's a couple people involved. Well, I just thing. remember him being up for the Academy Award and mm-hmm. him not getting it. And they were like saying oh, hey, how he was overlooked. And then I think was it the next year or the couple years after when he finally did win for Color of Money. Color of Money. And was- he, it's always been talked about where he, that was he should have won for The Hustler and didn't. And then he should have won for The Verdict and didn't. So this was, look, we got to give him one. Yeah, Color of Money was sort of the like. Yeah, I, he, he was owed this. He was owed this right, because exactly. I mean there was there was also um, there was a bunch of them. I mean there was the, there was talk of him in the Sting. There was talk of him, uh, Paul Newman. Let me see, read some of the other ones here. Because um, he only got one, right? He only got one for Color of Money, yeah. I believe. There was absence. And think of, about all the great movies he's been in. Well, there was a bunch of them. Fort Apache, The Bronx, Absence oh, yeah. of Malice. Um, oh yeah, I that was a great. About that that one. Was with with um, uh, absence of malice, where he plays the guy who's wrongly accused. Sally Field is in it. Sidney Pollack, of course, directed that. Like so, there was all these movies that that um, that Paul Newman had just gotten. He should have won for. You know what I mean? Like he just he just couldn't ever quite. That happens sometimes. Like when you don't win and then all of a sudden you win for something well that wasn't as good as those other ones that he did but i feel like there's almost like a a built up goodwill towards well we got to give him one now look at this look okay. at all these right. movies yeah. he didn't win for cool hand luke right yes. <laughs> you know like oh god uh, yeah although I mean, george kennedy won for, mm-hmm. in that should have hud hud supporting yeah for sporting yeah i mean so but the verdict the thing i love about the verdict is he's broken 
Yes, down and out. Down and out alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And and he's given this, isn't he given this, he's kind of, this, this case gets thrown on him in his lap thinking that he's not a good lawyer. And that, yeah, that it's given to him like, well, he'll sweep this under the rug. Right. And he goes, no. Yeah. And there's those great scenes with Jack Warden. Yeah. In the movie. And then he just finally like, he's been a broken guy. He's, he's like, he's like, isn't he a money trouble? Doesn't he kind of do some shady? Yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot of. Like, isn't it? I, I thought I, like him hanging around trying to ambulance chase some cases and. Right. And then this thing comes across his desk and he's like, but it's wrong. You right. Know, like it's, it's, he's, he's kind of asked and he's, he's like, I can't do this anymore. Right. And they think he's, like you said, they think he's just going to brush it under the table and get. He'll play it. ball. Yeah, exactly. Give him and some it, money and some booze. And this is where ball. he basically takes his stand. Oh, it's such a great. Movie. Yeah, it was a good movie. Like that one. Um, what else do I like? Well, and if yeah. you want a little bit lighter, but still a courtroom, courtroom drama is My Cousin Vinny. <laughs> Another Academy Award winning film. <laughs> But if you look at it as like, you know, how many lighter court heart, courthouse dramas are there or right. courtroom dramas, it really is one. When you look at especially the end, um, a lot of it takes place in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, right. And it was I think that was like one of the first. I mean, there there aren't that many comedic courtroom dramas. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't. I mean, unless you count Three Stooges shorts. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that was one of the movies that kind of turned all these other movies on its ear, like kind of like, all right, well, we're going to make a, a funny version of, you know, these really right. serious courtroom dramas. And that's why I think it worked, because that movie could have easily been a flop and didn't work. But I think because it had this history of all these great courtroom dramas behind it, right. I think it worked as a uh, as a comedy in a weird way. So, but that's also worth uh, checking out if you yeah. ever, if you haven't seen My Cousin Vinny, check it out. But of course, And Justice for All is another fantastic one if you haven't seen that. Ah, oh, And Justice for All. Um, what you, that one was Al Pacino. Al Pacino, yes, in an amazing performance. And Jack Warden. Yes. Um, you know, I, I know some of you um, younger listeners may see Al Pacino in things, and wow, he's kind of a parody of uh, right. Of like, he kind of turned yeah, into turned that. into a parody of like what he used to be. But if you seek out his earlier work, is all I could say to you. If you see if you see Al Pacino in some weird, crazy, over the top role, ignore it and go to his truly fantastic body of work. Go to. And Justice for All, go to Serpico, go, go to all these other Dog movies. Dog Day Afternoon. Dog, yeah, Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. Go that, see the, the real Al Pacino. Yeah. And Justice for All is, again, one of those, and it's, it's 1979, but it's in that vein of where, you know, America in the, the, the 70s and even in the early 80s before, like, the Reagan years kind of took over, America had been sort of broken. Right. You had... Watergate, you had Vietnam, you had the Kennedy assassinations, you had Dr. King assassinated, Martin Luther. So we were just sort of this broken, we started to get cynical for the first time. Right. And you see that in all of these great movies where it's like, and Justice for All, you know, he's a defense lawyer, but he's got to defend this judge who's on trial for rape. But if he doesn't, the, then the, the judge is going to disbar him right and he's got to play ball in this dirty inner city <laughs> right. corrupt cesspool without losing his own dignity but it's just like it's such of those those dilemmas of morality and ethics that the podcasters go through all the time <laughs> <laughs> this horribly corrupt <laughs> digital broadcast. <laughs> um, and that's the famous line, too, doesn't it? It's, Sir, you're out of order. I'm out of order. You're out of order. This yes. whole court's out of order. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it's great Al Pacino stuff. Mm -hmm. Who's a, a, you know, trying to be a, an honorable man in a shitty situation. Yeah, I would recommend that. I'd watch 12 Angry Men. Yeah. Then I'd watch... Not uh, the remake, to be clear. Yeah, not the remake, the 57 <laughs> one. Um, then I'd watch uh, The Verdict. Verdict. Mm -hmm. Then I'd watch Injustice for All. And yeah. then Family Business. And then Family Business. <laughs> I, still rec I still stand by it. I still stand by it. <laughs> family Business. What was that? Yeah. Uh, the, the Travolta one. Oh, Class Action. Class Action. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. that. Uh, Robert Duvall is amazing. Fantastic in that, in that oh. movie. He just had that really slow kind of 
creepy menace to him, yes. you know, and he's, you know, he's eaten his lunch in like this corner of, uh, and, uh, he, he's like interrupted and, and the young uh, kid yeah, yeah, like, and he's, like, like, oh my God, he's going to kill me. Yeah. He's gonna- <laughs> he quietly says, you know, and if self-preservation is a thing you hold dear, you will never interrupt me at this time yeah. again. You know, and it's just like, oh, this man's going to, he must have razor blades yeah. in the front of his boot or something like that. Like, Yeah, and that's a, it was a great example of, like, big business, you know, just wearing the little guy down, mm-hmm. going, look, we're just gonna, we're just gonna kill you in a sea of paperwork and it's just gonna cost you and cost you and cost yep. you. And isn't it, if I'm not mistaken, class section was based on a true story. John Travolta was playing an actual attorney. Yes. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's it was. It's about yeah. an actual case. Here, and, let's pull it up real quick. Um, class action. Um, and it's the movie too. Nineteen ninety one. No, no, no. Oh no, it's not the Travolta one. Class it's action not. is Gene Hackman and Gene Mary Hackman Elizabeth Messer. Yeah, Tony it's a, it's a um, a father and daughter that are on opposite sides of um, a case, and all their dirty laundry in the family be, becomes. It's not a. Up. It's an okay. It, it's, an, it's not bad. It's an okay we movie. But what this is, is it civil, it's not the John Travolta one. It's we're civil talking action. About. A civil action. Civil action. Yeah, That's yeah, yeah. it. Oh God. Uh, uh, but yeah. That's well, okay. put that on the time code. Well. Uh, <laughs> We'll edit that out. No, we're going to leave it in. A civil action. You can hear us <laughs> miss the movie for 30 minutes. Then... It's Travolta I, and Duvall. It just, it's great. Civil action. You, you looked yeah, that up. It's Travolta looked and that Duvall. Up. What I loved about it, too, is uh, uh, the setup of his character where uh, John Travolta is not going to take this case because there's no money in it. But then he sees the big corporate names on the trucks pulling out of uh, right. um, the town, and then that's when he gets involved because he sees the parent companies have money. Right. Um, and uh, But then it's, it's a great story, too. And then, uh, But check it out. Is that Sidney Pollack? Because he's in it. No, it's directed by, uh, it's directed by Stephen Zalian. Uh, who directed, he's been a producer on a lot of big things. Uh, he directed All the King's Men, uh, A Civil Action, and Searching for Bobby Fisher. God, I love, oh, I love Searching for Bobby Fisher. Um, but there's a great scene where Travolta's in talking with, um, Sidney Pollock, plays a lawyer or something, mm-hmm. and they go to his office or they go to the, some fancy gentleman, not a, not a gentleman's club, but a, like a, like a, like the Esquire Club or yeah, something some like rich that. Guy. Yeah, where they sit around and they smoke cigars and drink fancy scotch. Yeah. Oh, Eyes but, Wide Shut? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they go to the set of Eyes Wide Shut. That's exactly. <laughs> Sydney Ball's place in there. But there's a weird scene where he, he's like telling Travolta to take his shoes off and put his feet up on this glass table. And John's like, I, no, I don't want to. And it's such a weird, uncomfortable, really interesting scene. I, I don't know. I just I don't know why that sticks out in my head, but it's just. But that's Funny. what I think what makes this movie great is there's all of these little great scenes like that with all these like William H. Macy is in it, Tony Shalhoub is in it, uh, John Lithgow. Like, and they all have the James Gandolfini plays one of the guys. Oh, yeah, that's right. Dan Hedaya. Like, all these great character actors have all these great little scenes in little meaty, uh, civil yeah, action. Um, all right. So. Hashtag a civil, not uh, <laughs> not class, not class <laughs> action. <laughs> um, um, so now let's get to uh, DVDs and Blu-rays. First, let's go to your pick before we get to the abominations being released this week. Uh, um, Joe, um, Joe is this crazy movie? I, I just, you know, it was weird. You used Nicolas Cage and not a bad movie in the same sentence. It's Nicolas Cage is in this. And it's one of these things. We should really get Netflix as a goddamn sponsor because we pl- promote the shit out of them so much. Yeah. The problem um, is they. Well, that's why no one has them as a sponsor. Yeah, because they don't need to. No. Um, so, uh, an unnamed online movie place yeah. uh, <laughs> with a big catalog. Um, I was flipping through and saw this and was like, Joe. It came out in 2013. It stars Nicolas Cage. I'm like, what is this? Um, and I'm like, what, what is this film? It doesn't, it doesn't make Nick Cage and who plays the kid? Um, the kid is played, uh, it comes out to 2013. It's directed by David Gordon Green. Uh, the kid is played by Ty Sheridan. Um, and it's really, I think he's the same kid who play, who has the tumor in the forger. 
Oh, wow. Which was interesting. He was also in some movie called Mud, which I didn't... Oh, yeah. Oh, He's one of the kids movie. in Mud. Yes. Yeah, he is. Because they just kept saying it was so funny to me. I was looking at his... Because I'd never seen him before. And he's like, he is in Joe and Mud. It's like, what other coffee... <laughs> slang Java. coffee movie that he could be <laughs> he's in. in. Java. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, you're right. He is in The Forger. Uh, he's one of the kids in Mud. Why well, I didn't realize that. Mud is a really cool movie. You know, that was one of those when Matthew McConaughey was di- finally starting trying to break out Killer Joe, Mud, trying to break out of his rom com thing. But and now, what's Joe about? Here's what Joe is, Joe is about. It's a similar thing, and I think this was. This was um, Nick Cage's attempt to kind of break out of this. He's been in all these horrible movies. He had mm-hmm. tax trouble. He's saying yes to anything. Uh, an ex-con who is the unlikeliest of role models meets a 15-year-old boy in his face with the choice of redemption or ruin. Um, so Joe is uh, – Nick Cage is this guy. He's an ex-con. He's got this nice little business in this small town in Texas, you know, clearing trees or whatever. He's real honest. You know, honest day's work for an honest – he's doing okay and finds this kid. The kid's dad is, a, is an alcoholic and abusive. And this movie, I was like, it's based on a novel by apparently Larry Brown. It was surprising. I was like, I kept going. It was directed by Sidney Lumet. <laughs> uh, came back from the grave yeah. to direct this. It was really <laughs> unbelievable. Um so this guy directed it, directed The Sitter, Pineapple Express, like, huh? That's what's weird. But he does a pretty good job. David Gordon Green, there's some gritty stuff, and he, what He's I... He's been around for a while, David yeah, Gordon Green. I don't know if I know this for sure, but I got the real sense that he hired all of these, like, Texas character actors... Because I felt like I was in this small town. Like, wow. it was like all these gritty, like, Jesus, that guy has, probably is the goddamn sheriff of, of that town. And <laughs> these guys look like, they, you know, this one guy who's like his head, um, you know, his head uh, guy that, you know, runs the chain gang or whatever. It was just this guy with this thick accent and gold teeth. And you barely understood what he was talking about. But I was like, cause that's, I bet you how he actually talks, you know, like that's who he is. But there's all these great character actors. Um, and there's these really gritty scenes and man, there's a lot of like, Ooh, there's these people are like awful, like the worst, yeah. the worst parts of the of humanity. They make hitchhiker jerky. Yeah, they make hitchhiker jerky <laughs> in this small, small town. town. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they do. It's, it's a great place to get hitchhiker jerky. So it kind of, it kind of caught me off guard. It's a good film. Okay. It's a good film. It's worth great. seeing. Um, all right, and then let's go to one that is not worth seeing: uh, Seventh Son. I oh, had Jesus. the um, misfortune of seeing this actually in the movie theater. And if you want to see Jeff Bridges do a sketch character for two hours. <laughs> Uh, a medieval sketch character, oh. go for it. And this is also one of the things that's like, oh, we can't do new movies, no IPs. Guess what? This one based on a book and completely unwatchable. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really fascinating. And it's got Julian Moore in it who um, uh, plays a witch who can also turn into a uh, dragon and some other uh, great things where Sounds everybody's great. called a witch in the movie. Like, he has to fight the witches, but then one of them has an army of assassins. One of them just looks like a monster. One of them can turn into a monster, and one of them just looks like um, Genghis Khan. <laughs> so it, it's really fascinating where uh, I think what happened is, all right, what costumes do we have left? And then uh, <laughs> let's just dress everyone in whatever we have available. We'll call them all witches. <laughs> and, it's just uh, like, hey guys, run into the costume yeah, barn and yeah. just help yourself. See what, and, see what you can find. Like Ed would look um, at how to make them. <laughs> yes, there were some. What can I get my hands on? Yeah. It, it really had the feeling of some foreign investors lost a lot of money. Uh, this is how this movie felt. Like somebody just showed up. I got a Viking yeah. helmet and a, and a bow up. Yeah. Wear it. You're Wear a witch. Well, we've got ten million dollars to spend. You may as well use it. Um, so it's a really, it, it's a fascinating failure. And, uh, <laughs> what a wonderful, it, what a wonderful yeah. way to put that. And, and, the, and the reason is, is because, um, it looked like money was actually spent on the actual production. Like the special effects looked pretty decent. Um, there were some wide sweeping shots and some wide sweeping uh-huh. sets. Um, where it fell flat was the writing, directing, and acting. 
So other than that, <laughs> so you're saying th- yeah. this is you're, you're nitpicking a little yeah. bit. These I'm are nitpicking li- a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you had a uh, <laughs> you had a couple of cool character design, like creature designs, <laughs> but uh, don't expect anything that resembles a film. You know, if oh, you okay, watch okay. this, so uh, so. But it really don't go with like, big expectations. No, and it really looked like. <laughs> Just was like, uh, well, you know what? I'm getting paid. I'm in another country. No one's watching me. I'm gonna do a weird action. Just all like this, you can't even understand me. The whole movie, and that's literally how he talked in the entire film. And it, so it was like he almost needed subtitles. And it was weird because it was subtitles to hear dialogue I didn't want to hear anyway. So it was like even if there were subtitled, I would have refused to read it. Uh, so <laughs> it was so the mumbling's dumb. more yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was absolutely fascinatingly stupid. Like uh, <laughs> someone said, um, "Here's two hundred million dollars. Make the dumbest movie you possibly can." And someone went, "Okay," and they did. Don't you wish you were that famous that you could just act in a movie? And you know, he just showed up on the set and just went, "Brilliant! Do it! Fantastic! Keep that! No one's gonna go. Hey, what are you? What are you doing? No one can understand you. Talking about? Yeah." Remember when I kept calling you before shooting, saying, let's have a yeah. meeting and talk about it, and you blew me off? Remember? Yeah. <laughs> Remember you didn't want to do a rehearsal? Remember yeah. that part? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, because you he knew. He goes, yeah. oh, this yeah. is a piece of shit yeah. with foreign money. I don't care. Yeah, I'm I'm, Yeah, I'm walking it in. <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's so great. Well, speaking of another disaster, mm-hmm. the movie The Loft added a limited theatrical release. And a remake, too, oh, of a foreign film. A remake of a foreign film. It's worth watching in the sense that it makes zero sense. <laughs> and the dumbest cliches. Did anyone turn into a dragon? <laughs> all, well, it's all it needed. It, all it needed was a shapeshifter. Right. <laughs> it's these like four or five wealthy, good looking guys that decide to get a loft apartment so they can all have, they're all married mm-hmm. and they all want to cheat on their wives and this is the, they're going to do it. Right. right? Mm-hmm. So then they all, oh, one day they find a body. Oh, who's so, are they, is one of the, are they being set up? Is one of the guys turning on the guys? Did the ex-wives find out? And you know what? Who cares? <laughs> Does it matter? I don't care who done it. I just, I'd rather, I'd rather figure out how to do better heisting. Right. It's it's it, with my family. With my family, I'd rather go heisting with my family <laughs> than watch this. It's like why you know seriously go watch Battered Bastards of Baseball or Joe or you know uh, then then this nonsense yeah. or watch or it. go see Tomorrowland and uh, not off. Uh, periodically and wake nice, up for the really cool scenes. Get a nice nap between mm-hmm. cool yeah. scenes. That way you're really alert for the good part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and then, um, I, unless you want to just see how bad a movie can be, mm-hmm. like, was the, and it was, I think it's based on like, it's a foreign film that they remade. Yes. So did they did they not know plot structure in this foreign country or did Where they, was the original not bad? The original pretty interesting <laughs> and cool and then these guys got a hold. Yeah, they got a hold of it and ruined yeah. it. Like I'd rather almost see <laughs> the uh, original film. Yeah. Or so, Jeff Bridges do an accent. Or Jeff Bridges do an accent for two hours. Uh, <laughs> by the power of Grayskull. <laughs> Who's in charge of the electricity bill? <laughs> we got to split this five ways. <laughs> um, I'm going to put it on the refrigerator. <laughs> Don't leave lights on in rooms you're not using. This is my f- shelf, my food in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can split laundry detergent. God. All that dialogue far more interesting than was actually. <laughs> um, so now let's go to the site spotlight and the fan feedback. Uh, we got an interesting email from uh, Grandma. Have you read it uh, about chroming from uh, Mad Max? Okay, so we we had this discussion. Um, Gary, I don't know if you've seen Mad Max, but we did a spoiler rep on it, and we've had a bunch of great discussions. I had a discussion on it. Uh, I did Will Anderson's podcast, Fofop, Fofop. Mm-hmm. and we talked about it, um, which is what this is. in. Re- so in Mad Max, these crazy guys that are working for the bad guy would spray their face with, like, silver paint when they knew they were going to, like, 
sacrifice their lives. As like an anointment. Like it was like a privilege to have yes. this. Okay. Happen. Spray my face and I'm going to meet Valhalla. Yeah. And, they, and then they would like do something to, you know, they sacrifice their own life to help the, 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 the right. rest of the army or whatever. So we were theorizing on this show and on Will Anderson's show what that, where that came from. We got right. a great email from, uh, Stephen Hansen, who's, um, not related to the Milwaukee Hansen brothers, but uh, maybe they are. But he's. Um, but he runs a heisting and chroming factory. <laughs> he runs a he- heist, heist, Melbourne's heist and chrome. Um, <laughs> so if you're down in Australia, go to Melbourne's heist and chrome. <laughs> um, so uh, Steve writes, hey, Graham, big fan of comedy film nerds. And I just listened to you on Tofop. Uh, and where you and Will were theorizing about the silver spray, the war boys, that's the name of the, 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 the guys that are all bald that are kind of painted in right. white, sprayed in their own mouths. Uh, I have another theory to add to the pile. Chroming is a cheap and nasty way that people get a rush by spraying sil- silver slash chrome spray paint into a bag and inhaling. They are pretty obvious to spot as their mouth and nose are covered in chrome after. It can make people who use it want to do dangerous or crazy shit. So it could be that on one of his visits to Melbourne, George Miller, uh, who directed Mad Max, saw a chromer who lived near me in West Melbourne, who I once saw holding up traffic on a major road as he was rollerblading down the center with a chrome mouth and nose, oblivious to his surroundings. Uh, Love your work. Can't wait to watch your buds. All the best. I think this is the best theory. Yeah, I yeah. think so too. Yeah, because so. isn't it what like a good filmmaker would do? Is they'd see something and kind of add it. Yeah, you know, and, and give it like a religious connotation. Yeah, like yeah. if mm-hmm. these guys that are chroming just to get high today, after the apocalypse, right? And Immort- Immortan Joe would use it as a way to control them too. Like it gives them a high and also asserts control over them. Right, and you get someone hooked on something, you can absolutely control them. Just right. do this. For this drug, and and wouldn't also. By the way, the villain. This is another trivia that a fan brought up. It's the same actor that was in the original Mad Max, the character that played Toe Cutter. Is really? Joe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, mm-hmm. that son of stuff's great. Mm-hmm. It's it's another, and I think this is a great theory, and I'd love to. I, I I hope it's true because it just gives more credence to the fact that George Miller just brought in all these amazing details to Mad Max. Well, also, the other th- you saw on Twitter, all the other fans were saying, we said, what are, where's the Thunderdome reference? And someone said, well, his sanctum was a dome. Right. Was the actual Thunderdome. So yeah. another great theory. Great theory. Mm-hmm. I love all your guys' theories and all the emails and, and stuff you've been posting on the Facebook and the Twitter has been great. So Stephen Hansen, uh, landscape architect and chrome heister. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your email. Um, so, All right. Okay, and let's uh, uh, also Neil's Maggie review. I wanted to mention this. We might mentioned it before, but uh, this is you know when Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, you know he does it like he said in that interview. He doesn't need to really promote the Terminator movie, but this one where you know his daughter is infected with the zombie virus, but he doesn't give up on her or send her to the zombie camp. Or he looks for a cure and tries to help her, and that's the kind of the low budget slow burn journey of the uh, film and and you really liked it so it's a good it's it's the kind of thing that Schwarzenegger needs to do more of yeah to really branch it's out really intriguing as an aging kind of action star really because that's there's only certain roles that they can play anymore but this is and but there, much... there's and the, but there's ways to make them cool there's yeah. certain choices that you have that you could make that would be really and interesting does he need I mean does he need another Terminator movie? Does he need another fifty million dollars? Yeah, mean, like probably not. Uh, and also in development is another Conan movie. Oh, that I'm down with. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I am too, actually. Uh, and with with uh, but with Arnold Schwarzenegger, they said yes, it's of gonna, course, it's going to be him. Like you know, years later, the King, right? Conan the King. Uh huh. So I am. I hope really... they get that guy with the Viking helmet from Seventh Son. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm really hoping. Hey, Conan. So we'll, so we'll see what happens Don't with that. Donate all of the Fruit Loops. Let's see if it actually makes uh, gets made. <laughs> um, all right, so coming out this week, San Andreas. Yes. Shaky camera. This is, oh, my God, this is great. If you want to see overpaid actors run from a green screen, this is the movie for you. <laughs> um, the only thing that makes me really want to see this is I love The Rock. Uh, I do want to see it just for him, and I want to see him punch the earthquake. I just want to see him. Just there's something's coming towards him, and he just punches the earthquake. I this guy. But the trailers are so dumb and so overblown and overly dramatic and so ridiculous. Uh, I'm like, I oh god. But it's the same director that did Cats and Dogs: The Revenge of Kitty Galore. 
Oh, well, that explains everything. <laughs> sure, sure. What a great choice, then, for a giant epic disaster movie. And Journey to the Mysterious Island. He also directed that. Oh, yeah. Here's why I want to see it. Mm-hmm. Here's the headline. The Fault is San <laughs> That's the big fault. Is you go in to see this. Uh, <laughs> um, that's awesome. Some <laughs> entertainment writer has already done that. They've already, they haven't seen the movie yet. They've already. Yeah, the, the, the already, lead is already written. The negative is already in there. Um, I want to see it only because I remember as a kid watching the disaster movies, Earthquake. The 70s and, ones. Yeah, Towering Inferno, all yes. the airplane movies. The Poseidon the airport, Adventure. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, I'm like, I got to see this. And I think too. And they're destroying uh, San Francisco and LA, which is like, you know, everyone always complains that New York and LA always get blown up. California dream. In that yeah, trailer, yeah. they got this weird, creepy, like, like version of the song. Like, really? Well, this giant tidal go? wave comes yeah. and wipes it. I uh, got to watch it. I, um, I'm going to see it. So, I know uh, it's going to be dumb. I know what I'm doing. You know what's interesting is that every other well, studio. Your fault. It's, I have no one to blame but <laughs> myself. Yeah, yeah. I have no one to blame but myself. Every other studio steered clear of this film. Weird. Like, there's literally, um, but you would think, oh, well, this would be a good time for a little counter programming. Somebody would want to maybe see something else, but no. Clear the decks. That's well, actually, much it. they did. The only thing. The, well, there is Aloha is coming out. Yeah, this Aloha, but this is a low budget Cameron Crowe movie that uh, I'm not very hopeful for. <laughs> I'm. It's one of those things where I watch the trailer and all the actors, I'm like, God, I like all these people. But then, like, some of the story points and some of the right. dialogue, I'm just like... Let me just read you the IMDb uh, line. A celebrated military contractor returns to the site of his greatest career triumphs and reconnects with a long-ago love while unexpectedly falling for the land the hard-charging Air Force watchdog assigned to him. I Like, I'm already bored, and I was actually... I was just reading it. I know. So it, it know. really... It just... It feels like a weird kind of, like, Cameron Crowe, what are you doing? That, that he, His movies are really hit or miss... The thing about Cameron Crowe's films is it's a very small target. When he's in his zone, his movies are brilliant. They're absolutely fantastic. But when he goes out of that comfort zone, he's one of those directors that can't really stretch. Like, Mm -hmm. it it just ends up being kind of a mess. Like, Vanilla Sky, do you remember that movie? Yes. Um, That was a Cameron (laughs) Crowe movie. Yeah. Then it was a creepy science fiction movie. Yeah. uh, like, Like, well, wait, this is, you just showed me two distinctly different films that were cut in the middle. So and it was the kind of, and the other thing too is no matter what movie it is whether it's that movie or um you know even like we bought a zoo or whatever the soundtrack is always an extra character. So when you saw it in Vanilla Skies the soundtrack another character I'm like oh, it doesn't really work here but you know his other movies um and of course like almost famous brilliant fantastic movies. Um so I guess you're saying this weekend if you want to see if you've seen everything that's already out right you want to go to the movies. It's a coin toss on which type of stupid you're going to get. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> stupid rom-com or yeah. stupid The Rock punching an earthquake in the face. Yeah, I might recommend checking out a film you might have missed over the last few weeks. Okay. You know, um, you, and you may want to steer clear of DVDs, too. This is like a dead zone for movies this week. I just love a celebrated military contractor. It's like... <laughs> Yeah. It's not even in the military. I know, this, this, those, ad, is, those adjectives don't even go what is, together. Well, I'm assuming he's like like a like a like a he probably was like special ops at one point, and now and he then works became for a contractor. A, yeah, right. but be, if, if you're special ops, you're you're anonymous. You're right. You're you you go and what, undercover. Or is it just like you, you're celebrated? Like, you right. your pictures on the paper. <laughs> And what is the, or is he like an actual contractor? Like, he came up with the Kevlar vest. Yeah. <laughs> sold a million of them to the military. Like, right. yeah. You know, it, it's funny too. He invented the Hesco bag. I don't know if, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if other countries have this, but when we use the term military contractor, it's a very broad term. It yeah. could mean many different sure. things. Sure. Yeah. Do you work for Halliburton? And right. You exactly. Did the, you did the, the worked at the Chow Hall. Yeah. <laughs> or, in Basra. Or, or, or you did you work for Blackwater? Or, yeah. Or, or I were spoon you the beans. Ops I'm and, a Halliburton. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a celebrated contract worker. I, I spoon the beans to the kids. <laughs> yeah. It was nice. It was a good job. Wow. G.I. Joe, I want them beans. <laughs> <laughs> This movie's going to be great, guys. I'm really fired up for it. So good luck. Uh, Well, I believe that's our episode, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Oh, let me just real quick, because I saw this over the weekend. I was like, oh, my God. Uh, Memorial Day. 
Yeah, that was I'm flipping over around. The what better movie to really? encapsulate what Memorial Day is about. I watched Taking Chance. Oh, that's so it's, an, it's literally an hour. It's like 75 minutes. It's like an hour 15. It's an HBO movie. HBO no, movie that. with... What's it um, called? Taking Chance? Taking yeah. Chance with um, uh, Kevin Bacon, Bacon as a uh, army colonel who escorts a body. A uh, fallen soldier. A fallen Iraq. soldier escorts... Escorts the remains back to. It's if I'm it, not mistaken, it's a true story. It is a true story, which makes it gut wrenching. Gut wrenching. And if you, if it, I, I I tweeted the other day, just said if this is not, you know, required viewing every Memorial Day for everyone, it, it should be. It's one of those films that, um, uh, because when any anytime somebody, you know, dies overseas, they have somebody escort the body. Yeah. All the way home. Yes. And this kid, Chance, was from some small town in Wyoming or something yes. like that. And you're seeing it's based on the, like, the memoir or the book or whatever from the guy that escorted him that Kevin Bacon plays, I believe. Right. Um, and it is like I remember that personally because – uh, I didn't mean to bring bring the no, show no, no, down, man, but it no, was so it was just one of those things that why I watched it over the weekend. I was like, oh my god, this is it's a great movie. It's 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 a tearjerker for sure because it's yeah. real and it happened and it reminded me personally. And I don't know, maybe you have some of these stories too, Gary, because I know you've been to Iraq and Afghanistan. But I remember there was a flight the first time I went to Iraq and Thanksgiving of '07 uh, with Scott Kennedy. You're right. We, at the end of the, you know, we did two weeks and it was, you know, it was a cool tour and everything. We had like a rocket attack, but nothing too crazy. And then we were flying, we're supposed to fly from, you know, uh, Baghdad down to Kuwait, which is about an hour and a half on a C-130. And then we got, re they call it fragged, but we got rerouted to Basra to pick up, you know, they go, oh, we got to go pick up HR. Fragged has multiple meanings Yeah, it well. does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but they, they said... Uh, yeah, we gotta go. We gotta go pick up HR, and we had Tom Watts and some other pro golfers on the tour, and and Scott and I just looked at each other and went, "Oh man!" And they went, "What's that?" And we're like, "That's human remains," and we had to pick up a flag draped coffin, and they we had to get off. They had the whole ceremony loaded right. on all the aircraft on the flight line stop. Yeah, and they loaded in first, and they're like, you know, you're not allowed to take pictures or any of this kind of stuff, and then we flew all the way to Kuwait and then it was on our commercial flight to DC and and it was I remember just going how emotional it was for us you know we're crying these yeah. pro golfers are crying and then to think about the guy that Kevin Bear you know the actual guy that Kevin Bacon played in the film then had to then deliver the you know obviously the family got the news but then to deliver Right, yeah. It's just and you also see the whole actual process. Yes. You know? Yeah, there's there's people who who clean the clean mm -hmm. the body and mm -hmm. then there's the people who make the uniform that's going to go on. Uh it's it's I like I said it was like if anything, you know, yeah. wipe the the barbecue sauce off your lip and go yeah. in and see this and realize what the that whole day is about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's all I needed to. That was good. I'm glad you brought okay, it up. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. It was good really film. great. Taking good chance. Film. Um, well, that's our show, guys. Um, so Gary, where can people find you? I'm going to be with you in Las Vegas. Vegas, baby. baby. That is. Um, we are working the improv at Harris Hotel and Casino in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, July 14th through the 19th. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Um, where else? Or where can people find you online? What oh, you get on Twitter. I'm at, uh, at Gary underscore Brightwell because some hump in England has my... <laughs> <laughs> What's that guy doing? Oh, he just shows pictures of his his, his BMW uh. X5. Is all, that's all it is. Anyways, but for some reason he has the... the Does he take the, your headshot to them? Nope. <laughs> it's just some guy in England that's just wastes his Twitter thing. So if you guys want Beamer shots, go to Gary Brightwell. Yeah, if you want, if you want me, Gary Brightwell, Gary underscore Brightwell. Underscore Brightwell. I, 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 you know, that you can find me there, and uh, and let's just see what the comedy film nerds bump. Guys, yeah, just, I'm at 508 followers. Let's yep, see how many. Give I both get. Gary's a Twitter bump. No, just uh, just this one. Right, just yeah. me. <laughs> I don't want to go down any, any UK BMW enthusiasts. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't want to take you down a peg. But, uh, 
but uh, but start following. Go, uh, go underscore. Go underscore. Go follow Gary underscore Brightwell. Well, what I hope is I because I, I I sadly call this guy a hump every time I'm on one of these you know a podcast. I know at one point somebody he's going to be actually a fan of some podcast that I'm on. He's going to go. Hey, hey. Uh-huh. what did I do? <laughs> yeah, I have the same name. I got to here before you. I, I, not, I yeah. bought your CD. Excuse me, I had my shit together before you did. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, people like my BMW photos. Yes. Yeah, why don't you take a picture of your car? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, so follow Gary underscore Brightwell. Hey, we'll see yeah. what the comedy film nerd Yeah, book hashtag is. underscore work it. Yeah, hashtag <laughs> underscore work it. That's how we'll know. Um well, cool. Yeah, like I said, I'll be with Gary uh, headlining the Vegas Improv July 14th through 19th. Uh, but Minneapolis, Minnesota, I am coming to headline the Comedy Corner Underground June 19th and 20th. Uh, it's a 74-seat venue. Andy Erickson is opening for me. She's really funny. I've used her in the past. Uh, so tickets are going quick. It's 15 bucks, but there's no two-drink minimum or anything, so it's a great deal. Uh, nice. Yeah, come on out for that. Um, and of course, uh, Chris and I, can we announce this? We're going to be a podcast movement. Yes. Um, in Dallas, Texas, July 31st, we're doing yep. a show and then, uh, some panels and stuff on, on August 1st. On the, yeah, on the Saturday. Um, and then we're out. And then we're out. Uh, and then I will be, um, Headlining the Improv in Lake Tahoe, August 19th through the 23rd. Uh, and then headlining the Hollywood Improv, uh, Saturday, August 29th. And then, of course, uh, Los Angeles Podcast Festival, September 18th through the 20th. Um, it's worth it, people. Yeah, you've come. Yeah, I yeah. came last year for the first time, and it was well worth it. It's so good. Sweet. It's really Very good. Cool. It was a blast, and we're adding bigger and bigger shows this year, guys. Yes. The discount hotel rooms are starting to go. Mm-hmm. Um, rooms start as cheap as 199 bucks a night, which is an awesome deal to stay right there in Beverly Hills. Yep. Yeah. And we'll be yeah. announcing That's more nice shows hotel. very yeah, really soon. Great. We're actually out to some offers right now, so we'll, we're, uh, we're trying to work that out, and uh, it's going to be a great year. It's yeah. going to be our best lineup yet. I would, yeah, I would I would definitely, definitely try to attend if you if I if you're a listener out there. Yeah, make the trek. Seriously, you're going to see Doug Loves Movies. You're going to see the Sklar Brothers, Todd Glass, Aisha Tyler, Janet Varney, W. Mark Cumbell, Marin, Mark Marin, uh, W. Cumberbell, and uh, Kevin Avery's podcast, and Thrilling Adventure Hour. Thrilling Adventure Hour is now in. Never not funny. Mm-hmm. It's um, already a great lineup, and it's going to get better too. Going We're going to be at a lot. To get better. So sweet. It's uh, we've got we wanted to mention a couple other things too. Uh, we're going to be getting some new things in the store, so check that out. But also make sure you use the Amazon link. And also we do an extra every episode too. The guest uh, does like a movie recommendation or uh, tells a story about a movie, and you can only get that if you have the CFN app. And you can get that in the App Store at iTunes. But if you have a Droid device, you can get that on Amazon. But why not go through the affiliate link on our page hey. and get the uh, get the Amazon app. For your droid, and you can get that bonus extra content for it's only every show. $1.99. Yeah, it's only a dollar ninety nine. There's a PDF that lists all of the movies we talked about yes. and what we thought about them. Yep, and then also there's, uh, like I said, there's extra um, content where the guest talks about an extra film. Dollar ninety nine. Dollar ninety nine. Boom. And you get the entire back catalog too. You can get every episode. It's cheaper than a Viking helmet and a boa. It is cheaper than a Viking helmet and a boa. Think about this. If At you most a, places. If you went to a bar, a beer is four bucks. This is a dollar ninety nine, and you get right. it for forever. Yeah, and you don't piss this away. Yeah, it doesn't get you. You don't have a <laughs> headache the next day when you uh-huh. use it. Well, maybe. Or give you dog yeah. breath. Might give <laughs> well, you I won't dog. give you dog breath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We'll give you a headache. Always great doing the show. We love doing it every week, and thank you so much for listening. Yeah, uh, we really appreciate it. We also appreciate like you guys on Twitter, on Facebook, and on, uh, a little more activity on the message boards. Like you said, we just uh, we have moderators there. We do have one rule: keep it civil. Be nice to each other. Don't be mean. You know, if you have an opinion, great. If you have a counter opinion, great. But always keep the discussion civil, or um, the moderators will block you. Mm-hmm. So, but we want thank a civil you. action. We do. We want a civil action on the message boards. <laughs> <laughs> Not a class action no. on the message boards. We want to, that's Gene Hackman's that's message board. That's Gene Hackman. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much. No thank problem. you, Gary, thank for being you. on the show. Thank you. Uh, always fun. My name is Graham Elwood. And I'm Chris Mancini. And as always, remember, Han shot first. first.